Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll just wait a couple more minutes to uh, for a couple more people to show up. Interesting weather out here today. We have a high today of 72, and yet yesterday was 93. So very interesting weather that we're having out here. And um, we are coming to you from downtown Healdsburg as usual for this uh, Friday webinar. And um, today we'll be looking at what goes on in the vineyard during the spring. And you'll also notice that Luke is with me today. He's sitting in the room next door. So if you've got any uh, chats, he's waving at you. <laughs> so if you've got any chats, you can uh, quickly ask him. Thank you, Luke. Waving is important from a distance, from a distance. And uh, he will, uh, he, he has the ability to interrupt me. So um, anyway, let's get going. I'm gonna share my screen. Today is gonna be a little bit different. Last week we didn't show any videos at all, but today because I wanted to show a number of things in the vineyard, we're gonna show a number of videos. And I would normally, I, I would love to do it live from the vineyard, but unfortunately to jump from vineyard to vineyard uh, is a little bit difficult. And also doing it live in the vineyard with the lack of Wi-Fi that we have in Sonoma County is pretty bad. In fact, we can't even get much very good Wi-Fi at our house. So we're just going to be talking about spring work that's that's happened or is happening uh, in the vineyard, and we're going to have some big boy uh, talk here too. Just a bit of breaking news for us is that during the fires in uh, whatever month it was, I can't remember now. Where was it? Uh, October. We uh, we had to evacuate our house, and uh, Hillary, our youngest daughter, took out. <clears throat> two cats down to our to Chelsea's place in San Leandro and one of the cats got out well guess what two weeks ago or well, last week I'm sorry they found the cat and we now have the cats reunited back at the house it's been a amazing story and it even made the San Leandro Times for those who are up on the San Leandro uh, newspaper that's a photo that happened there also Hillary is just uh, graduating high school and because we're all sipping in place um, <clears throat> we have a number of darts uh, so people have dropped off um, congratulatory uh, notes to her and we've got the darts hanging up outside our our office window so for those who are driving down Hillsburg Avenue feel free to drop off a dart at 631 Hillsburg Avenue and we will hang them on our little clothesline there with the, with the pegs so that's what's going on in our town in Hillsburg but we are gradually opening up we have uh, a number of tasting rooms just starting to open and some restaurants as well. I took this photo yesterday, so this is where we're at. We're at flowering. You can see that these little brown caps have yet to drop off. So we're in the middle of flowering. And actually, when I went north yesterday into Cloverdale, we actually have a, a small amount of set as well. Overall, the crop looks pretty heavy. And so we'll see what eventuates around Veraison time, which is when we do a lot of the uh, work. <clears throat> so the list today, we're going to go through a tractor work, obviously mowing and spraying, looking at irrigation, which is something that we did a couple of three weeks ago, we have to basically walk every line in every vineyard, looking at suckering and wire lifting, and then we're going to jump into uh, some vineyard prep as well, which I've never done before, and I actually went out and took some videos yesterday of some vineyards getting ripped out, and so we'll look at that, and then we'll have a quick little update on our, at the end of our staircase vineyard. So this is uh, our vineyard at home, sitting in a tractor, and uh, which is what we do. And these are the discs that we have been working. So I'm a big fan of permanent cover, as a lot of you have uh, recognised, especially from my upbringing in New Zealand, where we have a lot of rainfall early in the season, uh, or late in the season, sorry. So when we harvest, we want to be able to get our machines down there by having a permanent crop, a permanent cover, we can, you know, the, the moisture gets into the ground pretty quickly. However, when we're in an arid environment and it looks like we're going into another drought season, we have been disking a little bit more this year uh, than normal. I will take that advantage to turn the organic matter in. Uh, yes, even in organic vineyards, we do spray, and, uh, but these are organic sprays that we use. And mainly the big, the big objective here in California, of course, is powdery mildew. And in terms of disking, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the vineyard next door to us. It's not our vineyard. But normally we would disk every other row. But because of the lack of rainfall, these guys have decided that they're going to disk every row. 
and so that's uh, that's what's going on here. As far as organics, uh, people don't really understand that farming organically is is very difficult. It takes uh, a lot more labor, hand labor, especially around weeds, uh, which is the big one. But we also, uh, you know, fungicide, herbicides, and pesticides are the big are the big sprays in non-organic vineyards. And I, for me, as you've heard me say before, I think herbicides is the biggie because herbicides, you know, when when you remove herbicides, we really notice the increase in good guys and bad guys for about two or three years in terms of insects, but after about three years, the good guys gradually take over. But going through those that that changeover phase is pretty difficult, especially in a vineyard that's been herbicided for such a long time. Anyway, so that's me out using a weed whacker a week or so ago uh, in our vineyard at, at um, the Chelsea Merlot Vineyard. We also have to deal, though, with diseases. And in an organic vineyard, organic vineyards tend to be under a lot more stress. And so diseases or plants that are weaker are more prone to diseases, especially Pierce's disease. When we live on a riparian area, such as the river, like we do in Dry Creek, we get a lot more PD. Mealy bug is more of an issue down in, in um, Carneros, not so much up here. And then spider mites are a big deal when it comes to organics as well. So we have to deal with that. And basically we're using a lot more oils and soaps uh, than uh, obviously more traditional vineyards. But yeah, powdery mildew is the big one. And then what we do is we spray lime sulfur. For those who don't know what powdery mildew is, this is a photo of powdery mildew. Basically, the skin goes really uh, thick and strong and you cannot get through it. The mildew just builds up a complete surround all over it and affects the, the leaves. And if you don't take control of it, it goes onto the canes as well. And you'll end up, it'll end up being a, uh, a continuous cycle year after year. So can be a, can be a little bit difficult to to control, but it is the big one. At least in the US, we don't have to deal with um, downy mildew, which is the other one. The advantages in organic vineyards are many, but uh, the proof is this: what you'll find in organic vineyards is a lot of uh, uh, cobwebs, and that this these cobwebs are on the ground, obviously, and that is a clear indication that there are no herbicides being used. There are no synthetic chemicals either, and it, but it does include fertilizer. So we do put fertilizer on most of our, on most of our um, uh, vineyards during the winter as well. Hopefully the rain will, will move some of that in. Uh, Luke, just if you want to butt in, just put your, put your camera back on as well so I can see the question. Uh, but herbicides is the big one, but without this chemical, you know, you can really feel the life in the vineyard and that's really important. And I know that with organic vineyards, we are farming uh, a couple of vineyards now in Sonoma County and obviously two of the vineyards over in Oakville as well. So Hillary and uh, Rendition, which is another wine that we make, both come from organically grown vineyards. All of our vineyards are registered sustainable though in California, Oh, sorry, in uh, Sonoma County. Napa County has not put in rules and regulations yet for what sustainability is. So that's just a quick uh, look at w the way we can do it on a big scale as far as uh, how to do weed removal rather than having me out there with a weed whacker. So there are other alternatives and those machines are getting better and, and faster as we move forward. And that, that was one of the, uh, the vineyards that we work on up in Canada. Feet on the ground is really important, especially when it comes to irrigation. You've really got to walk the rows um, and we'll talk quickly about suckering and then wire lifting as well. You can see that we don't have any water penetration here, irrigation penetration here, because the lime in the soil has become so strong that it's very hard for the irrigation for the water to get in. We also see it in salt soils as well. And this is becoming more and more of a factor of, of people who are not farming organically or, or at least sustainability, sustainably with uh, cover crops, et cetera. So maintaining a good organic matter can alleviate some of these lime and salt issues that we have going forward, especially as we go into drier climates. As far as irrigation though, coyotes are the big one for us. We have um, 
the coyotes uh, love to chew on the irrigation lines because there's plenty of water there. We're quite lucky where we live though, because we live on Dry Creek River, but up in the Alexander Valley, typically they're further away from the river. And so they can puncture those lines and cause these huge fountains. And uh, you can, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, we talked about hard water, the calcium buildup. Dirt in the filters is another really big one that we look for. <clears throat> and then the emitters themselves getting plugged after a number of years, they do get plugged. And uh, so we have to look, that, look at each emitter to make sure that they're all um, dripping. And then some of them in the wrong place. It's very difficult to work out because when you lay the irrigation hose, you actually have to add a little bit of length um, because remember in the winter, the hose will contract and then some of the hose will expand. And so sometimes when we lay those irrigation lines, they're not exactly perfect. You can see here on this uh, video that the, the water is not penetrating at all. And that's because of another issue, which is compaction. I'm standing in the vineyard and this is the colour of the water that we're getting out. I guess it's not filtered. I love that. I love that video. I've shown that one before because uh, these guys were wondering why their, their drip lines were not working well. So we popped the end off the, uh, the hose down the end of the row and of course that's what came out. So obviously they're not, um, they're not uh, filtering or the filters were totally inadequate. Uh, as far as emitters, we use these these two gallon emitter, two gallon emitters, and sometimes we actually put in two hoses if we have uh, a young vine as well. And if the emitter is not in the right place, we'll actually this is the emitter here. We'll actually put a small hose here, a little drip hose, and we'll put it onto this young vine. Now, after the vine has become about three years old, we will pull that because we don't want the water dripping completely onto the trunk itself because that can increase diseases and it's not very effective. So what we do is we allow the water to drip here and so that'll allow for root expansion and we'll do the same thing on the other side as well. So this is, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, this is a vine that we only planted two weeks ago, believe it or not. Other indicators of issues is we see weeds and sometimes we get, these weeds can be as high as the canopy and you're walking into the vineyard with a winemaker and you're like, dude, you know, when did somebody last uh, check this irrigation line? Because obviously uh, no one's been looking and it's a pretty clear indicator. The other one too is if you have this sort of thing, this is a, there's a couple of issues here. Firstly, you can tell it's more of a clay soil here, which is, which is one thing, but that clay soil means that you're going to have more compaction. And that's what we see here with the tractor tire. You can see that during the winter, this tractor uh, obviously got bogged down in the, in the mud. And then when you have a leak in the spring, you'll get the water will just sit on the surface. So another clear indicator that there's a blocked emitter here somewhere and that uh, we need to be fixing that. As far as suckering, <clears throat> uh, we often talk about suckering around the head, but we also have to sucker around the trunk of the vine too. And so this, these are new machines that have started coming out. Uh, these, are in the, uh, these actually uh, rotate. Uh, they will become horizontal to the ground rather than vertical to the ground. And they, I will show you in a second here of me rubbing out some, some suckers, but this is just to show that we can also do it mechanically as well. Sorry, I don't have a video of that. So suckering is a big part of the job and we often talk about suckering up in this, in the head zone that we're going to pull these shoots out and, and uh, open up, but we also got to sucker down here as well. And so cleaning this area out is also important because we don't want any rootstock uh, growing and that competes with a scion of course because this is the graft union and this is the scion up here. We don't want these shoots growing up nor do we want shoots growing on the trunk either. So yeah, we don't only uh, suck her up here but we also got to suck her down low as well. Hi, this is Nick. I'm looking at a cane prune vineyard here. So this is the cane that we laid down in the fall this year. So this is last year's wood. And you can see we have one bud here instead of two that we normally get on a spur prune vineyard. Another bud here, another bud here. So you can see that all these shoots are very clearly separated. So very little suckering is required. We leave one shoot here. This will be the replacement cane for next year that we'll lay down. This is an extra water shoot so we can take that off. And we'll just clean around the head. We leave uh, 
we always leave two two canes in the head on one side and two on the other and again we take off anything that's small or uh, in the way anyway that's how you uh, sucker a cane prune vineyard a little bit quicker than the, what we do with a spur prune Okay, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm just going to show what it what we do when it comes to suckering. Now, this is a spur position vine, so we left a two bud spur here. So these are the two shoots that we will keep. The rest of them are water shoots or replacement shoots. So water shoots meaning there's a lot of water or there's a lot of vigor in these arms, and they will push extra growth or extra shoots. So we want to take those off. I'm going to um, actually leave this one here as a potential replacement for next year because we want to keep the spur positions as close as we can down there. So all the rest can come off around. And there we go, we just have uh, the two replacements, uh, the two uh, uh, positions that we left for last year and the one that we will leave for next year. Yeah, you've, you've heard me talk about spur pruning and cane pruning before, and I just sort of throw that up too, because it's, you know, we talk about cane pruning being much longer to prune, but uh, much quicker on a spur prune situation. But when it comes to management during the season, you can see how much longer it takes to sucker a spur prune vineyard rather than the cane prune vineyard. So you may save time during the winter in terms of pruning, but, and it's, you don't have to be as smart because you don't have to know the architecture of the, of the uh, vine as much uh, with a spur prune, but you can see that you spend a lot more time in labor when labor is a little bit more in short supply during the spring and summer as a result. The next step of course is wire lifting. And uh, so we were lifting wires yesterday. This is, uh, these vineyards are up in Cloverdale. So they're uh, a little bit warmer up there. We have one vineyard up there and they were lifting wires yesterday. So that means that We've had good growth. We've had about a meter of growth. So normally we talk about 13 leaves per shoot. And right now we're about nine or 10 leaves. The tendrils are still growing or the tendrils are still there. So we know that the tips are still growing. In fact, I should have taken a photo. Uh, you can always tell when it's growing because the difference between the second to last leaf and the last leaf, if they cross, if they touch, that means that the vine is slowing down. If they don't touch, it means the vine is still growing. And right now they still don't touch. So they are still growing at this time of the year. Uh, and we started to throw clips up on the first foliage wire. So you can see this is the, the, the fruiting wire and this is the first foliage wire. This would be the uh, second foliage wire. This would be the third foliage wire. So you can see this vineyard has grown a lot more than this one. Uh, so compensating for bad management. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here. I had a, I put up one of these on, Instagram the other day and I had a lot of comments about it, which is the too many bud one, which we're going to show you. And then a lot of short shoots. Now this, we don't normally deal with a short shoot situation yet. We normally do with it, deal with that at Verizon. Although personally, I, I'd rather get in early. I'd rather do it now because what we're trying to do is limit the number of clusters on uh, short shoots, because if we take one cluster off now, then hopefully that shoot will grow a little bit longer and, and help ripen that last cluster. And then I'm going to show you a photo of a, of a vineyard that's got too much crop. So here we go. So you think these look like ordinary vines, but inside this jungle, there is a hidden trap. And this is what growers do. They will put a extra long shoot here that they call a kicker cane. So this is wood from last year, but they've trained it vertically up. And so you get an extra four to five shoots this one's a four cane shoot they've left extra four or five shoots here and so they can increase the amount of crop and i do not like this at all because this is a spur prune vineyard but they obviously don't think they've got enough yield so they throw in this kicker cane to increase the yield not a good way to do it and if you were a better pruner than this you wouldn't need to do it because what you could do is use this as a spur position for next year and put two buds on there and two buds on here if you so choose but not to do this thing which is called a kicker cane and these canes are just another way to be a lazy spur pruner in terms of increasing bud count not good and the the other thing too that i didn't say there was that when you have four canes like that going up those top two buds those canes get tipped 
And so there's no way that you get to the 13 leaves per shoot, you know, because those you've already got an extra, you know, foot, foot and a half above the uh, fruiting wire. And so you just can't get enough ripeness on those really bad situation. And I cringe every time I walk into a vineyard. In fact, uh, I very quickly figure out which grower is uh, going to be my friend and which one is not. So luckily that vineyard is not ours. Um, it was a neighboring vineyard, <laughs> but um, it's not, it's not an uncommon thing to see that. So here's just a random vine. This is a short shoot. We've got one cluster. There's the length of the shoot. The next one. Oh, there's two clusters on that short shoot. Here's another short shoot right next door. It's got two clusters on. Here's another short shoot with two clusters on. Yeah, there's no way that you can ripen two clusters on a short shoot like that. That's only got like three or four leaves. It's no way. That's why you got to get the, if you get that, that top cluster off, I don't know if you know this, but the bottom cluster ripens before the top cluster. So if you take the top cluster off now, uh, spring, you will get a little bit more growth, but most growers only want to do drop. They only want to drop once. So they normally go in at Verizon time. And if you recall, I showed a, a photo on our, on our webinar last week of what it looks like when clusters are half black and half green uh, and how difficult it can be in terms of timing of cluster removal. So in a perfect vineyard and what we're going to be doing at Staircase and what we do at Rail Yard, our, our own two vineyards in the Alexander Valley is we'll get in there now to, uh, to drop crop. And when we talk about yield, it's a very complicated point of view, you know, and, I, and some of you heard me say this before, uh, when, you know, a prospective buyer says to me, well, you know, how much new wood do you use? How much ML do you use? How many tons per acre? I always sort of laugh at the, the ton per acre one because, it's, you know, when we first, when I st started here in California, we were talking about, you know, 1,100, 1,200 vines per acre. Uh, see me, we started doing this thing called, we called it close planting, and we planted 2,100 vines per acre. And now we can get up to uh, 3,500 vines per acre. So tons per acre is kind of meaningless. It really depends on kilos or pounds per vine rather than, uh, rather than tons per acre. But also for me, the other thing is, you know, making sure you've got the, the, the right number of buds per meter. So buds per meter, we talk about as being 15 buds per meter is the industry standard. But how many buds per acre does that mean? You know, so you've got that whole concept. The second concept is if you were to graph, and some of you have seen me do this before, if you were to graph quality against tons, you know, what is the, it's a bell-shaped curve, you know. So let's say this is three tons. Uh, we get great quality between three and five tons. This is a really bad drawing. I should have made this better. Uh, you know, so you've got this, this, this range of two ton per acre of quality, and that really depends on, you know, is it an ideal season? Is it an early season? Did we have enough rainfall? I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. But in hillsides, like on tops of hills, that bell-shaped curve may look like this. You know, so we may, um, this, only, this gap may only be, you know, from, you know, three and a half to four and a half ton. You, you, your gap for quality on a hillside may be much smaller. But then if you're on a deep, fertile, caneros clay, you could have a range like this. It could go from like one ton to, you know, not eight or nine ton and you still have the same quality. It doesn't really matter whether you take crop off or not. So it's a very difficult conversation is, is, is tons per acre. But in general, in terms of Alexander Valley, we're typically about three and a half to four and a half ton an acre. So we're right in there. But so uh, try not try to stay away from that question unless you uh, unless the person understands what it means to do pounds per vine or or buds per acre. That's really more and more important. This is a situation where you can see that these vines are overcropped. So this is at set, uh, sorry, this is um, right before set. You know, we're going into set now. Uh, some of these clusters, this was the vineyard I was telling you about, I went and had a look at yesterday, where we can see that we, we're just getting into set. But for me, the crop is too heavy. Already we've got short shoots. So that's a short shoot. Uh, this is a, a bilateral cordon. So we've got one cane down here and one cane down here. So there's separation. But you can see these shoots are too short to be carrying crop and that crop needs to come off now. And this is what we call apical dominance. So here's the vine here. 
And you can see we've got good growth there. And then we've got the cane, which they laid out, which would, in my mind, is too long because it should only be 50 centimeters. They should cut the cane here. And then they would have had good shoot growth there. But no, they laid the cane out all the way along the wire. So we have this thing called apical dominance. We have fruit here and fruit here. So we're going to jump in there and make adjustments on that immediately because I do not want to see this go forward. And if you don't take care of it, this is what happens. Uh, don't be surprised. This is a, um, this is Movedra uh, that was uh, growing in a, <laughs> in a pretty famous vineyard actually in Chile. But these are, these are uh, overcrop situations. This one here is an interesting one because you can see that the clusters, even though it's a heavy crop vineyard, they actually spread the, the clusters out. And I don't mind that situation too much. Another one is this one here. Uh, this was another client of mine, which I started about mid-season, and so they'd already gone through Verazon. But actually, the wine ended up being pretty good because you can see there was good exposure. The row orientation worked, and actually, the color turned out to be really good. And, and uh, this is Merlot. Color turned out to be really good and, and not very herbaceous at all because I would have, looking at the vineyard, I was going to go, man, we're in trouble here. But actually, the wine turned out all right. So, yeah, again, don't be confused between, you know, quality and, and tons per acre. So the other thing that we're working on right now is replanting dead missing vines and in some situations we are also this is the time of year that we pull vineyards as well to get in for, for um, planting uh, at this stage but we could talk all day about it but right now Sonoma County is on a go slow and so it's very hard for us to replant vineyards because we can't get permits so even if you're going back in on a vineyard you still have to get a, a, a permit to replant. So typically in an older vineyard, we're replanting due to Utypa or Pierce's disease. We could be replanting uh, with young vines. And if you plant a young vine, then you've got an irrigation issue because those small vines need to be watered separately. And that's why we plant bigger vines, which I'll show in a minute. And another result is we're seeing more and more poor planting. This is what we call J rooting. So this is the, 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 the vine but they didn't dig the hole deep enough. So when they put that vine in the ground, you get what we call J rooting. And so the roots go along, they didn't actually go into the ground because when they stuck that vine in, the uh, roots turned. So that, it's true for home gardening as well. Make sure you dig that hole big enough so that the roots eat. And you know, what I do is when I plant a vine or plant a, a tree, I dig the hole bigger than I need. And then I fill it in a little bit just so that the roots can go downwards uh, after I put the plant in so it can get through that broken dirt. Other reasons for uh, uh, replanting at this stage is we might be changing the variety and there's a number of ways to do that. We can do chip budding, uh, cleft grafting or on an old vine situation which I'm going to show you or we can do the classic bench grafting if we want to plant in a new vine. And then I'm going to show you uh, uh, pulling a vineyard and, and what results. So this is a chip bud. So you guys have heard me talk about this before. Basically, we'll take a, um, uh, this is a cleft graft, but I'm just jumping over here. So you take a stick that may have three buds on it and we'll chip, we get a knife and we chip the bud out of here. And that's what this is. We make a little cut in the, um, in the vine. This is wood, this is the woody area. And then this is the cambium. This is the cambium area that we want because we want to match that to that. And that's how we get the, the transfer of, of water and other nutrients from the main part of the vine. So this is the vine that um, we want to change the variety of, and we can just chip that bud onto there. This to me, this was a uh, field budding situation where we planted a rootstock, and then we came in and we put Cabernet in on top. So uh, this piece here holds the bud, and then this piece here is the match. The other uh, situation is you can, Instead of uh, putting on a rootstock like this one, this is a situation where they wanted to change the variety. So this rootstock was okay for what they needed. I didn't like this rootstock, but anyway, they decided to keep the rootstock. In the, this was a Merlot vineyard, and now they're putting Sauvignon Blanc on top. So that's a Sauvignon Blanc bud, which they put on, a, on, a, uh, on an old vine situation. Again, I'm not, quite a, I'm not a big fan of this, I'm more of a fan of this. This is a cleft graft. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute of one other way that they do this. But here's a rendition, an artist's rendition of what that looks like. Basically, you make a cut across the top of the trunk 
and you um, cut these so they, they, they look sharp. Again, what we're trying to do is match the cambium layers. So you put it on the outside of the vine because we want to match the cambium. We were going to get the, the flow of nutrients. We'll tape it up and uh, do that. This down here is a bench graft. So this would be, this is a much different situation. This is actually done in a warehouse where we um, uh, will we'll do this. We'll take the stick, the rootstock, and we'll put the sign on top using this, this bench graft, and then we'll put it in a, in a glass cell situation. We'll develop the roots, and then the following year we'll take it and plant it. So this is, this is the way uh, planting has normally been done in the past. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's really cool. <laughs> anyway, so that's a uh, slightly different way to do it. So he sliced down the side instead of cutting across. It's um, it's actually harder to do what he did just then. That guy's he's a pretty good uh, um, grafter. But when you you notice when he put the tape around there too, he left the bud exposed, and that of course is hopefully will get that bud to grow and the one above it. And he chose to put on a on a two bud. Normally we only, if, we, if he's a super good grafter, he would only put on one bud, but uh, two buds is fine. And check that out. So uh, this is a regular bench graft, that little um, bench graft that I, that I pointed out a minute ago. So you can see how much smaller this is and, and off to, what a slow start. So I took, normally has one of these um, cartons around it, but I took it off so you could see it. So this is called a, a dormant bench graft, so it has roots on it. We planted in the, we planted in the spring, and uh, you can see how hard it is to irrigate it, how hard it is to weed around it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is a raw situation. The whole vineyard, the field was planted like this, and then uh, later on in the season, they'll put up these. Well, I took the carton off. They put the carton around it to protect it from things like rabbits. It also protects it from mechanical. Um, and um, touching, for instance, this was weed whacked or again, so it was done by hand. And so we want to protect the the, um, the vine itself. So we put this around it and then subsequently we put up the irrigation, et cetera, to make sure these, these things are, are brought to life. So much smaller, much harder. And this, this vine will take three to four years before it produces a crop, whereas the vines that I'm going to show you in a minute, they only take uh, two years. So we save a year by planting a bigger vine. So this vine was planted uh, two weeks ago, and this is called a magnum vine. So you can see the graft union is much higher than you would typically see. Normally, it's right down there. The advantage is that we don't have any scion rooting, so that's not possible. It's only going to be the rootstock. And secondly, we can use less water because the vine's already somewhat established. And then thirdly, it's not going to get damaged from underground, or I mean, sorry, uh, surface weed management. We're not using herbicides, but we're using a sunflower, which is a machine that removes the weeds under the vines. So the vines are more sturdy. I prefer doing this. A little bit more expensive, but I think in the long term, better for the environment. So these vines were planted as magnums about 18 months ago. And so we're gonna get a crop on here this year. You can see that we are farming this organically. Uh, the weeds are being removed by hand by Weed Whacker. And we're leaving a permanent cover in the middle of the row as well. So the advantage of the Magnum Vine, of course, is that the, um, the graft union is higher up. You can see this is the graft union. Sorry, the, the hose is in the way, but you can see that. 
and we do not have the ability to have any scion rooting we have a bigger vine so we can uh, use less water and also it's better resistant against weed whacking and other things like that beautiful this will be cabin a out here on staircase Hey, uh, Luke, any questions from yourself either? Okay, everything good? All right, so let's get going on a uh, vine pool. The, so the boys in the audience are all gonna wanna see this. Bulldozers, man, bulldozers, that's what we like. So this is a situation where uh, these guys are pretty good. This is a video I took yesterday. I went out and watched um, some vineyards getting pulled out. So these guys are pretty good, they've cut cut the vines, uh, they pulled all the wires and the posts, and so now we're ready to go. This is uh, what this is the piece of the machine that you're gonna see work. Here we go on a vine pull. Young Jose is up on the, in the cab, and this is what it's like after a 30-year-old vineyard has finished its commercial lifespan. This is what happens. So the vines have been topped, the wires have been pulled, posts have been removed, and now we're going to remove the vines, stack them in a big pile, and then they get chipped or burnt. Anyway, a fine day, sad day, for the end of a Cabernet vineyard. So this is what happens afterwards. You. Uh that would the, the that machine was really good they've been fine tuning those blades that was a really big blade i like that because it actually lifts the whole vine out so it cuts the roots because one of the problems is when you remove a vineyard you have a lot of roots still in there and so subsequently when you come through and rip which we'll talk about in a minute you end up pulling up a lot of those uh those root systems so that machine was big enough that it was actually lifting out a lot of roots as well so you end up for those who come through uh, Napa Sonoma in the next uh, month or so, please come up and see us. Tourism is back. The you'll see these big piles everywhere, and that's what it is. What I like about this, what these guys are doing, is the uh, there's no wires in here, and there's no posts. And a lot of people uh, take these piles and they burn them with the wires and stakes and everything in there, which is I think is really bad. And you end up with a hell of a lot of uh, metal. Uh, and the result, you are no longer allowed to burn the posts, which is the wood posts, which is a good idea because those things are carcinogenic. So this is what the vineyard looks like. Um, when the vines have all been picked up, you still have the odd root sticking out, but um, uh, this is where the vines ended up. And then uh, ripping, there's two forms of ripping. The first one that I, I really like is, uh, this is in the spring. So when the, actually in the spring and the fall for two different reasons. In the spring, we'll sometimes come through here and what we'll do is we cut the roots so that uh, the spring is the best time for roots to, to uh, grow because that's, you know, that's the big, big part of the year when they're, when they're putting roots in looking for water and they haven't yet developed the canopy. So we can come through and rip uh, or cut the roots at this stage. This one here is being done in the winter. You can tell because these leaves are yellow here. So this is being done in the winter. And this will mean that it'll be easier when they put the fertilizer on here, that uh, it'll, it'll be able to penetrate a lot easier. This is our vineyard in New Zealand, actually. And you can tell again that um, uh, we don't have, well, we have permanent cover and there's no weed spray here as well. This is what we use uh, when we pull out a major vineyard. Um, I'll do, a, I think I have a video of that too, I can't remember. But um, basically there's about one and a half meters that will go down into the ground and I just don't think you can rip a vineyard enough uh, to loosen the dirt to be able to to uh, allow the vines, those young vines, to grow easily. So this is the next stage in a vineyard pool. The vines have all been picked up and put here, and we will now rip the vineyard up and down, of course, and then across, and then we'll go a third way across. It'll be ripped three ways, so we have a good mix. And you can see that we'll rip this down to about a meter and a half, probably, and we'll use these two big shanks on a pretty good-sized dozer to get that done. Anyway, this will all happen tomorrow, a little bit warm out here today, so don't have an action shot for you, but this is how it's done. 
So just quickly looking at the Staircase Vineyard, which is our new pride and joy that, that uh, we've got old vines out there that we're, we're re-establishing and, and bringing back up the standard. And at the same time, we're also planting uh, new vineyards as well. Uh, and we're also preparing for our vine pool as well. We, we had our last inspection on Tuesday this week. So with the SIP uh, order, we haven't been able to have inspectors to come out. And as I, I said earlier, I wish I had the inspectors to come out in, in March so we could have pulled the vines out in that month. But unfortunately, they've been resting in place as well. So they haven't been able to come out and do the inspection. So we finally had the inspection. We have to jump through a couple more hoops before we can totally replant, but hopefully that won't be too bad. There's an update on our staircase vineyard cabinet that's going to get pulled out. There's 20 acres here and we pulled the posts and the wires and now all we're going to do is pull out these big old vines. Man, they are huge. So uh, it'll be good to get them out of here and replanted. This was AXR1 producing about one tonne an acre, so not very commercially viable, hence the removal of the vineyard. Yeah, sorry, I didn't take one from the top of the hill where you could have seen the whole property, but um, uh, you get the idea. Part of the beauty of this vineyard called Staircase, and I'm sitting under a beautiful row of Cabernet. At two o'clock in the afternoon, you can see that the shadow is almost directly overhead, so the shadow, well, the, the sun is perfect and that we're not getting any, any sunburn on the afternoon side and hopefully by August at about four o'clock in the afternoon the sun will be directly overhead so um, that'll be cool so just the other thing that's cool is the uh, soil you can see that it's it's just all uh, schist and slate and here's a beautiful piece there which I'm not going to move but uh, just amazing this is some of the best soils in the world that you can get and see that just breaks in my hand i just love it and uh, we're so fortunate so lucky to have this vineyard and uh, this is called staircase and here in the alexander valley beautiful that should be um this will be the first year we've we've owned this vineyard for three years but this will be the first year i actually make that wine ourselves and i'm really excited about it that vineyard will produce about it's cropping at about three ton an acre because it's on a fairly wide spacing but the um that whole block will probably produce about 20 tons and that sits above that block that we're going to pull out it's a little experimental vineyard i put in for mel beck so what i'm going to do is i'm going to train these vines all the way to the top of that post like a a goblet system and then i'm going to tie these two vines together in the middle so that I can increase the amount of leaf area and increase the amount of shading because often in a gobbly system you get too much sunburn on the cluster and then if you turn it into a bush vine the shoots are too short. Anyway, should be interesting, should be fun. Mel Beck on a gobbly system. Yeah, this is, uh, you guys saw um, a video that I put up about two or three weeks ago where they make those tunnels out of those vines in Chile with uh, Rodrigo Zamorano, and we're going to repeat that here. I noticed in that video, though, that a couple of posts are a bit tall because the soil has some has pretty severe rocks in there, and so they probably couldn't get those posts in far enough, so we'll probably have to cut those off. So anyway, in conclusion, uh, this is a vineyard that, um, this is last year actually, this is a vineyard that we uh, that we walked into and had not been suckered, had not been tucked, had not been wire lifted. And this is that same vineyard after all that work is done. So you can tell that uh, this is the before shot, this is the after shot, this is old world style, this is new world style. And the reason why I say that is because this system is what we call, you know, the traditional California sprawl. So originally a lot of these vines were head pruned and then they, then they thought putting a few wires up was a good idea, so they put some wires up. And one good example of that would be our rail yard vineyard, where we still have Zinfandel growing on, on, a, sorry, on St. George rootstock, which is the traditional old Italian rootstock. And we threw a couple of wires up, and now we have sort of a semi-California uh, sprawl, which is not necessarily a bad thing, because you get more light penetration, uh, more light interception on the California sprawl. But this is a Cabernet vineyard, so we really wanted to get it into the vertical position. So then we threw the rest of the wires up 
And so now we have the traditional VSP vertical shoot position vineyard. Anyway, those are our social contacts. I had to prepare the slide for somebody else. So if you want to uh, watch this video a little bit later, it'll be on YouTube, which I know that you guys have, uh, some of you have seen me get a follow-up email where I put that, where I put that YouTube link up. It's, this one is also live on Facebook, but uh, please follow us on Instagram and Twitter as well. So thanks very much for your time. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing this now. And Luke, what about you? You got any questions, Luke? Are you there? Yeah, I was a little curious about some of the uh, fertilization practices. I mean, you talked a little bit about lime, but do you, is gypsum something that's uh, used frequently? That's mostly for filtrate infiltration, I think. Yeah, gyp, gypsum is uh, used for penetration as well, and it, it's, it's usually used in soils with um, a lower pH. So it's one way to change the pH of the soil. But what we're mainly interested in is, is organic fertilizers that you can actually buy commercially, the, um, uh, which is obviously it's a lot of uh, uh, chicken material, one might say. And uh, if you dry pass, so one of the big things that I did when I, when I was working at Idemec, we combined Geyser Peak and Clos de Bois uh, pumice and we sent them all over in fact if you can go down there now if you know where to go you can see that uh, even though those wine wineries are not owned by the same company anymore they still compile their pumice together and we combine that with some guano and uh, a lot of water and we have a machine that actually rotates the piles you'll see long lines of piles and then uh, we made that commercially available to a lot of other vineyards as well so our goal, of course, is to collect more pumice from, uh, from wineries around the place. The problem with using pumice is white wine pumice, is, white grapes are okay, but red grapes are a pain because red grapes have got a lot more acid in them. So because they've gone through fermentation on the skins. And so you have to be very careful about how, the combination of, of red pumice to white pumice. But this is a big deal for us. I think it's a, uh, uh, something that we really got to be working on in the future is trying to trying to um, capture a lot of that as well getting it into the ground is a difficult thing I mean using that big shank that you saw is one way to get it in in fact uh, sometimes now they have a tube going into the soil behind the shank and they're actually putting the forcing the uh, fertilizer into the ground that way as well I think I have actually seen those large piles of them producing that in uh in uh, Geyserville, somewhere near Trioni Winery, I think. That's exactly where the piles are. That, that land is actually owned by Constellation today, and um, they've, they've maintained that, um, that as well. Actually, I will say that what we do is we actually throw it under the vine. So we throw it under the vine and then we irrigate. This is during the winter, well, sorry, in the fall. We'll put the fertilizer under the vine and then we'll irrigate in the fall and try and get a lot of that to go in and then hopefully subsequent if we get rain then we'll get more um, penetration of that organic matter as well anything else luke you know everything um, now <laughs> yeah no I, I could ask you a ton of questions about soil um when you you mentioned so you said gypsum's used on soils that have lower ph like in what kind of cases do you find soils that have higher pHs? Because generally a healthy soil is like a, a pH around 6.3, 6a or so. But like where do you, in what parts of the world do you run into soils that are above a 7? Well, heavily leached soils like Langhorn Creek in Australia would be a great example. So the what's happened is Langhorn Creek at the bottom of Langhorn Creek for those who don't know there's it's an Appalachian in and a, in a sort of an arid area in Australia and Victoria and they have a, a lake at the bottom it's called Lake Elizabeth and for years and years and years people have been pumping uh, sorry it's in South Australia people have been pumping water out of Lake Elizabeth and so what's happened is the salt has gradually in the water table has gradually increased in the soil and as the water table comes up and down it leaves salt deposits and so the, about 10 years ago now they, they changed the law that you um, now have to take half the water out of the ground and the rest out of Lake Elizabeth you can't just take water out of Lake Elizabeth so a lot of these water tables are a bad situation 
And as a result, we, we have a lot of <clears throat> desert areas around the world that have resulted from poor or lack of understanding of irrigation. And so that's usually, it's usually a man-made issue when you have a high pH. It can also be a situation with uh, the way soils are weathered. For instance, uh, what's interesting is when you're, in a, when you're in a river basin, you would typically think that the soil at the, at the bottom of the hill uh, would be the oldest because the water has uh, eroded, the water has eroded the soil. And so what you're doing is exposing older and older soil as, as the water goes down. Does that make sense? And then, but in California, we've had so many earthquakes that this has become very confusing. In fact, a lot of the Alexander Valley, the oldest soils are at the top of the hill because there was earthquakes and the soils, the soils have moved around so much. And I remember at um, a very famous vineyard nearby uh, here that um, we couldn't work out why we had different, different pHs the pHs were opposite to what we thought. And then we started investigating with a lady called Deborah Elliott Fisk from UC Davis, who, by the way, if you ever want to know about soils in Napa Sonoma, Dr. Deborah Elliott Fisk, she is just a wealth of knowledge and she has many papers written on this subject. And she discovered, of course, that the soil down by the river was actually the younger soil and not the older soil. So that was, that was pretty eye-opening. And so we changed our fertilization as a result of that discovery. Any soils that you've liked uh, when you've been traveling around the world, Luke, that uh, have grabbed your attention? I know um, Maipo in Chile, which is fantastic, but see, even, even Maipo in Chile has a fairly high pH, but what other soils have you seen? Mm, uh, I think one that was pretty stellar that I saw um, was when I, actually when I was in Italy um, and we were visiting in the Piemonte region and went to a, a a vineyard of basalt which and it was just pure black purely black volcanic soil it was really incredible uh obviously like that kind of soil retains a huge amount of heat in this in the daytime like when the sun hits it that stuff just gets really hot um but it was a pretty incredible vineyard they were making white wines off of it i think it was uh i think it might have been um garganaga that they were growing on it it was pretty stellar and it's really it's really uh friable wine you know it falls apart like really nicely it's uh yeah. really healthy soil and usually black soil is an indication of a lot of organic matter yeah uh, for instance or uh, marine clays and that's an example in carneros and what you'll find there when you you know, you'll look at it in the black soil in the winter and you go, man, this looks great and good organic matter. And then you go back in the summer and the, and the soil is completely dried out because it's a marine clay and it starts cracking. And the problem is that when clay cracks, it actually breaks the roots because wet clay sticks and it'll stick to all those young roots that are formed in the spring. And when the soils crack like that, you're actually breaking the roots and putting the vines under stress. So what you're describing is a completely different situation where the vines actually can remain healthy as well. So yeah, just looking at a soil in one season belies what may, what may actually occur in the, in the, in the following part of the year. Yeah. I think maybe one other one that is, uh, that I remember very well is obviously in Burgundy where it's all limestone. It's heavy limestone there. And I, and there was a day in the winter when I got, I walked past a section of Quartz on Charlemagne, a di different producer, not, not Latour. And they had ripped out the whole vineyard, everything, everything's out. They've dug up all of the soil until they've gotten to the bedrock, which is only about a half meter down. And then they've taken a large crane style jackhammer to break up all of the, all of the bedrock. And then they are going to put the soil back on top and then replant. And this is because this section, I mean, this Appalachian is so well known, so expensive uh, that they need to have production on it. But, but apparently the vines have just been there for so long that, you know, they can't just can't get through the bedrock. So they get down there and they mix it up and then they, they put it back. That's a sur that's surprising news. That's yeah. surprising news. I thought that uh, Burgundy was, you know, left alone and it was the way the whole thing was. But I could send you a photo of it. Pretty yeah, crazy. no, I loved it. And, and actually, it reminds me, 
I should have put up a video. Uh, last week, we dug a soil pit out at the ranch and uh, it's where we grow Merlot. And I'm gonna put, I'll put that up on YouTube maybe over the weekend. I mean, on Instagram over the weekend, but it actually shows the water penetration and where the roots are. Because one of the things are, when we dig up these soils, Luke, and it would have been interesting, is uh, when we dig up these pits, and we see the vine roots, what I do is I get my fingernail and I'll scrape the, the, the woody piece off the outside of the root. And then I'm looking for the color of the inside of the root. And so white means there's a good amount of oxygen in the soil and there's good transfer between water and air. But sometimes you rub that root and it's red. And that red means it's highly um, reductive soil. And so this, the root is not being able to get any any moisture into the vine itself. So that's 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 also a really good indicator. And I, and I do that on this video. And so I'll put that up next week, but yeah, cool. Awesome. All right, well, thanks very much for uh, listening, everybody. I will post this on um, YouTube in, the, in the, the end of the day or Monday, <laughs> whenever I get some uh, some time. But I really appreciate you guys tuning in with us today and, and uh, and good luck as the country gradually reopens and hopefully you'll think of Goldschmidt Vineyards as you go about your day. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us and we really appreciate it.